got to say something profound so that you can tweet it. <laughs> it's a lot of pressure. I'm going to take my shoes off. Because they're actually not that comfortable. I just wanted to look really cool. Like, look at her funky shoes. Okay, so right, my name is Zoe Scruggs. And I'm a Buffalo native. And I'm very much a big part of the community, I think. My mother owns and is the founder of Eugenia Theater Company. She's been doing that for, let's say, about 50 years now. Um, my, my brother and I were raised through theater. So our love for theater and arts and serving the beloved community are all very important things to my family. My music, what I do, has always been a love of mine. When I first started singing, I was never singing for myself. I was singing more because it's a parlor trick. Like, you know how like your mom will say to you, come here baby and show auntie how you, how you do that. You know, like, come sing some Sam Cooke for your auntie. And you'd be like, oh my God, I don't wanna do. And then you start singing it, you know? Cause you know it's impressive, but you don't wanna do it. Um, and that was, my, that was my whole life. My whole life was on stage and, and um, you know, t learning how to be in front of people and learning how to express someone else's words and knowing the importance of words and how conveying words are, are important. Um, so, talking about music. So the first time that I knew that I wanted to sing, for real, for real, knew that I wanted to sing, not for someone else, but for myself because it's healing for me. I was in the car with my mother, going to Philadelphia, visiting family in Philly, and my mom's the DJ because at this time I was like maybe eight years old and no one's listening. You know, the whole trip is not gonna be what I wanna listen to, which is like Usher. So, um, <laughs> um, so you know, what, she, what she put on the radio, what she put on the CD player reigned supreme and I just had to be okay with it. Luckily, my mother's taste in music is phenomenal. So I was asleep and we're like maybe an hour away from being where we're gonna be. We're going to my grandmother's house when she still lived in Philly, West Philadelphia. Um, <laughs> and all of a sudden this like really beautiful voice comes on and it's Patsy Cline. I had never um, heard Patsy Cline before that day. And the song was Sweet Dreams and like, sweet of you. When she started that, I knew something inside of me woke up and I asked my mother immediately, who is that? Because that sound, the way she sounded like a bell. And that's when I knew that that's what I wanted my sound to be. I wanted to sound like a bell. I wanted it to be a hundred people in a room and I'm singing and you can tell, well, Zoe's in the fifth row, three over. Like I know exactly where she is always. Um, and that's nice because now sometimes when I sing, people are like, I could, I know exactly where you are. Like I, you're singing with how many people? I know exactly where you are on stage. And I'm like, yes, that was the goal. So listening to Patsy Cline, hearing that song for the first time, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. And I knew that I wanted Patsy Cline to be the person who taught me how to do it. So I listened to all of her greatest hits, that album that my mom had, that CD over and over and over and over and over again and learned how she said things, how she chose to say things, where her breath was, um, where the emotion was. And that helped me figure out then at some point later down the line where I wanted the emotion for me to be. Um, at some point it was time to figure out high school. And because I sucked at school, I was going to Lafayette and my mom was like, well, you know, we did all we could do. Like, you're not, <laughs> you're not a scholar. You're not someone who took school seriously. So you're going to Lafayette. Karma's a bitch. And I was like, okay. Um, and then my, my aunt Yvonne James Brown stepped in and said, no, she's got to be at performing arts. Like none of your children should be anywhere but performing arts. My brother went to St. Joe's and was a St. Joe's kid and like excelled and He's the bomb, whatever. A milk car is the best. Um, but when it was time to figure me out, we decided, okay, well, she can audition for performing arts and we'll hope that, you know, the, the grades that she did make will suffice so that she can be in a school that will really take her craft seriously. 
Um, and when it was time to audition, my mother went online and got me a, a Patsy Cline piano chart book so that I could figure out what song I wanted to sing. Because I was definitely singing Patsy Cline. Like, I sound great when I sing Patsy Cline. That's, that's going to be how I get into the school. The grades suck, but I'm really good at singing Patsy Cline. So I chose, um, I chose Crazy. Um, crazy. I'm crazy for feeling so lonely. I'm crazy. Crazy for feeling so blue. I knew you loved me as long as you wanted. And then someday you'd leave me for somebody new. Worry, why do I let myself worry? Wondering, what in the world did I do? Oh, crazy for thinking that my love could hold you. I'm crazy for trying. And I'm crazy for crying, and I'm crazy for loving you. And Frank Shinta was like, do you know you have perfect pitch? And I was like, yeah, I do. Right, so. <laughs> So quick, quick, quick fun fact about Perfect Pitch, to be honest, I didn't ever really know what it meant to other people because I'd never really been in a room full of musicians. Um, my mother, years ago, when I was like four years old, was doing a production at the Buffalo Philharmonic, and she was working with this maestro, and I'm there, and I'm singing some weird song from like Cirque du Soleil, because at the time I was watching that on VHS over and over again, because I was determined that I was gonna be a trapeze artist. That didn't happen. Um, but I really love this one song, I wish I could remember it, but I sang it over and over again. And she was just, you know, inter you know, letting me do my thing. And the maestro walked up to her and said, do you know that your daughter has perfect pitch? So like at the age of four, I was told that I had perfect pitch, but had no idea what it was. And then here's Frank Shinta again at the age of 15 telling me, you have perfect pitch. So I got accepted into performing arts. And Frank let me know that, you know, this is really the place for you. Like, I've never met a young kid with perfect pitch. This is really great. I'm really excited for you. You're gonna have a really beautiful experience here. And I was like, this is so great. I'm gonna be really cool. And um, I got there and I was in the general chorus with um, George Davis and George Davis is an incredible instructor, really knew his students individually. And I remember I had a voice lesson with him. He let me know, you've got to try out for Select Choir, which is Frank Shinta's choir. He was like, it's very competitive. Not a lot of kids get in. People audition every week. And he's very, very particular. And I thought to myself, I'm going to get in because he told me I got perfect pitch. I didn't say that out loud. <laughs> But that's what I thought, like I got this. So I went and I you know, signed in the application, I auditioned um, and he didn't, he tried his best not to show his excitement that I had found him, that I had found where to audition and I, you know, and we met each other again. But then a few weeks went by and I got in. And that was really one of the first times that I knew what it meant to do or be in something greater than yourself. Even though in high, even if it was in high school, you know, being, it was like, almost like Hogwarts, right? Like you're in this school with like kids that take something very seriously, you know, that love something that's bigger than themselves and they are harnessing this ability that they were gifted with, like just being gifted and talented. Um, so I was in that choir all up until I graduated. Um, and that was really beautiful. And within that time, my uncle Rodney, Rodney Appleby, who's definitely one of the best guitarists in Buffalo, decided to be my mentor. 
took me under his wing and helped me figure out what it meant to perform and what it meant to choose the story and know what the story is. So I remember my first gig with him, I had to sing um, Bonnie Raitt, which is, I love Bonnie Raitt, but the song was um, something to talk about. And she's like, you know, People are talking, talking about people. I hear them whisper, you won't believe it. They think we're lovers kept undercover. Um, but I just ignore it because they keep saying we laugh just a little too loud. We stand just a little too close and we stare just a little too long. I didn't know what any of that meant. Like, ideally I'm a hopeless romantic and like, oh yeah, like romance and all of that. Cause I'm just like cushy that way. But in real life, I had no idea what that meant outside of what Bonnie Raitt was saying. And I remember the first time that I performed, I did it on Ujima's stage. My mother put together like this concert for me so people could really see what I'm about. Like just me singing stuff I really like to sing. And um, Rodney Appleby was my accompaniment. And the first time I sang it, it really just made sense. People are talking, talking about people. I hear them whisper, you won't believe it. They think we're lovers, kept undercover. I just ignore it, but they keep saying we laugh just a little too loud. And we stand just a little too close. And we stare just a little too long. I thought, yeah, like that's, that's what she meant. Like that's, that's really just like really just liking each other, liking someone outside of what people are talking about. And you, you know, okay, well, if they're just gonna be talking about us, then let's give them something to talk about. And I really like that song. Um, so I started gigging a lot. I started going into bars and clubs that like I was definitely too young for, but my uncle Rodney was getting me in, and they always thought I was older than I was because I have an older voice. Um, and I dressed older. My mother always made sure that I looked appropriate, whether I liked it or not. Um, and that, that was really helpful for me cultivating my sound and me getting more in touch with all of those technical things and putting them in front of someone. Um, and then later, 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 I was gigging a lot. I was doing a lot of things. I was on stage more. And of course on stage was like a given because I was the singer that was in the, in the company. So like, there's a board and then there's a company of Ujima Theater Company and there's maybe like two of us that sing and there's like one of us that can actually sing. And so whenever there was one that really needed to sing, my mom be like, okay, well that's just where Zoe's gonna go. Whether I knew I was in the show or not, that's just how it goes. Like when you've got theater children, you just put them on stage wherever you need somebody. Like, no, no, just go stand over there and I'll give you the script tomorrow, cool. Um, <laughs> So I was always singing, I was always cultivating my craft, I was always making sure that I knew what it meant to keep my throat right. You know, drinking a lot of hot tea and doing a lot of practicing at home, always, always practicing, always practicing, always moving the esophagus, always working those muscles, always making sure my consonants were really tight. Um, and then one day, where a few years later, I'm older now, I was like, three years ago, I'm at Hall Walls with my brother Emil Carr and Preach, Free Preach Freedom, and they were doing a production of Top Dog Underdog. And it was like two years before I just saw Fela on Broadway. So I was still hyped. It was two years ago, but I was still feeling it. I was like, Fela Kuti is like the baddest brother in the world. He was the bomb. He was, you know, a Nigerian activist. He had like 22 wives. He was about that life, a crazy, wonderful musician, created a whole nother genre on his own. No, how many people have done that? How many African-Americans have done that? Created something all on its own, it's original, and people know that sound forever, you know? And, and that, I think, is what stuck with me, knowing the sound, hearing that sound, and knowing that's Afrobeat, you know? Just like I wanted people to hear me and be like, that's Zoe, and that stuck with me, and I, and I just love that sound. Um, so I started tinkering more at home, listening to his music, um, playing with sounds on my own. Like how can I, how can I make Afrobeat sounds? And then you're just playing around, like 
the horn will be like da 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 it was just like just playing with all of those ideas, playing with how your voice can be another instrument, how your voice can mimic another instrument outside of just singing. It was really inspirational. So back to Hall Walls. So they're like talking about Fela Kuti and we're all relating and blah, 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 blah. And I said, you know, to be really cool is if one time we did a Fela Kuti tribute concert. And Preach was like, whatever, with a concert, let's get a band. And I was like, that's a lot. And I'm not trying to do that. But if y'all want to do it, that sounds great. And the next thing I know, there's 17 people playing on stage at Nietzsche's. And I'm in front of them singing Afrobeat. And what I like about Afrobeat, too, outside of the sound, is that it's... It tricks, the, it tricks the listener. Like it all is good time music, but he's really talking about very serious political things. You know, he's talking about the freedom and the liberation of his people. He's talking about loving yourself and staying original. Um, he's talking about police brutality. He's talking about how we need to love each other. All in this like really light, really good time, high life, you know, undertone. And that spoke to me because my mother and my sister-in-law, my brother, like I said, are very deep in the community and like giving themselves back to the community and being a change. And I wanted to be one of those people just because it's like, you know, of course, like if that's who you come from, that's what you want to be a part of. And I didn't know how I wanted to do that until I, until I started working with the Buffalo Afrobeat. I knew that that was how I want people to hear me. So we do this song called I Want to Be Free. And it's not like a Fela Kuti song. It's, it's his son, Femi Kuti. And um, the words are like, Every day and every night, I ask myself, why, why, why? Is it because the light of day try to confuse I? And that is why. I want to be free from all these yeah yeah politics I want to be free from all these yeah yeah politicians I want to be free from all these cut up monsters I want to be free You just have to admit it Ah 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 For me, those words are like, you know, like, that's really powerful. That's really powerful to be standing in front of people you love, people you've always seen. Like, Buffalo's crazy small. Like, if you turn around one time this way and one time that way, like, you know these people from high school are like, yo mama knows they mama, which is always my life. I'm always in the street and somebody's like, you learn this baby? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> How did you know? You look just like your mama. It's like, great. You know, like that's always been my life, knowing, knowing someone because of someone else and like that's community, like making those links. So then standing in front of all of those links and being able to speak for them and speak for yourself and knowing that both are the truth. Like that's really, that was really important for me, you know, because music before that had always been like healing in another way, healing like this feels good because it's an old song or it feels good because something about this speaks to me and I wanted to speak to you as opposed to this is all how we link because Buffalo, I think Buffalo low key is definitely about social justice and we're definitely about paying attention politically and we're definitely about each other and loving each other and it was nice to be it was, it's, it's wonderful to be in a band that represents that for Buffalo. Like we go, we go out of town or we go to a festival and we're like, yeah, we're Buffalo's Afrobeat Orchestra. Like we are, the, we, are the, we are some of the representatives that help other people know like this is what we're talking about back at home. And that was really important to me being a part of that. Or it is important to me, I'm still in it, being a part of that. Um, and I don't get a lot of credit for being a founder, so I figured I'd tell y'all I'm a founder of the Buffalo Afrobeat Orchestra. You know, I know the grown folks did all the grown people work, but I'm the one who was like, we should do that. So that's mine too, just like it's theirs. Um, 
But like just going back real quick and talking about technique, I listen to a lot of different voices. Like after I figured out like, but I tried and I tried, but I haven't yet. Like listening to Patsy do all those like weird twangs and find her, you know, listen to how she makes her choices. Then I listen to like how Dinah Washington makes her choices. You don't know what love is until you learn the meaning of the blues. Like it's way, it's way tighter. It's way closer. It's way more intimate. You know, and I listen to Nina who's like, just abrasive she's just very abrasive and like in your face and like doesn't care at all about how you feel say love me leave me let me be lonely like she's like whatever you can feel how you want to feel about my voice is how i feel about my voice and i'm filling the room like other bells like list like picking up other bells and ringing them and listening and mimicking the sound and putting them back like a line of them and then when i got through all the women that i want to listen to I decided then I'm going to listen to a whole bunch of men because I love men. Sing I love male voices. I love that, cr that croon, that real sad, oh my God, she doesn't love me anymore. It's so good. <laughs> it's like my favorite thing. So then I started listening to Sam Cooke and that's like, for me, like the best crooner of all time. Like, darling, you send me, I know you send me whoa like the way he just like like finds love in the room and like ties it to a balloon and lets it float away like just fills the room with all these whimsical ideas all these lovely sweet ideas and then like Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra and Nat King Cole who's one another favorite you know just really paying attention to how they made their choices, and that was really important to me. Um, and I think I, I think I knew that I had gotten it when I sang. I made like my own rendition of "You Don't Know Me" by Ray Charles, and I decided to make it more like a country song. And my uncle Rodney told me, "I don't know how that's gonna work. You know, like black folks really love Ray Charles, and I don't know how they're gonna feel about you making it a country song." And I'm like, "Well." Ray Charles is definitely country. Like he comes from Georgia. Like if that's not if that's not like real life country, just like blues, I don't know what is, you know? And he's definitely playing with some of those ideas. You give your hand to me and then you say hello. Oh, I can hardly speak. My heart is beating so. Oh, and anyone can tell. You think you know me well. But you don't know me. Oh, you don't know the one who dreams of you at night, who longs to kiss your lips, who longs to hold you tight. No, I am just a friend. That's all I have ever been. Cause you don't know me. I never knew the art of making love. Cause my heart beats with love for you. Afraid and shy, I let my chance go by. A chance that you might love me too. Oh, you give your hand to me, and then you say goodbye. I watch you walk away beside that lucky girl. Oh, you'll never, never know the one who loves you so, because you don't know me. Oh, you'll never, never know the one who loves you so, because you don't know me. Thank you. And then he said, okay, yeah, you can do it. I'm like, yeah, this is, that's great. That's so good. I just love music. And, and then backtracking even more. When I was in high school and I was in vocal jazz ensemble, which towards the end was probably not that ideal of an experience, but was great for the first two years when I was figuring out how to be with like six people and making ones, like six sounds sound like one sound and harmonies. And I had never been with other people for real, for real working on harmonies. And to demonstrate a harmony now is gonna be ridiculous because I don't have somebody else to do it with, but <laughs> learning how to 
still though with a harmony making two voices that are doing two different things still sound like they're coming from one vessel was really was really like church like i don't go to church and my mother was raised christian and she never pressed us to find religion but i knew that music was definitely mine and when i learned harmonies i thought yeah like and harmonies is where I'm gonna find God every time. Because that, those notes, when all those notes come together, like, it's, it's really magic. Like, music is so magical and, and feels good. And when it's right, when music is right, it's right. And that's what makes genres so great too, is that because it's right for different people. Like, if I'm listening to Kid Cudi, or if I'm listening to, I don't know, Young, young Thug, what I love about Young Thug is never gonna be like what my mom loves about Young Thug. Like what she loves about Young Thug is that he's just a young man expressing himself. And what I love about Young Thug is that he's a young man expressing himself with like these little bits of tools. Like he doesn't have, or at the time, in the beginning, he didn't have the, the money to really have a full studio to express himself, but he had a tap machine and he had a old MacBook and he had GarageBand and he figured it out. He still figured out how to be his authentic self. He still figured out how to get people to hear him. And I was inspired by that too, because then it was time for me to figure out what my authentic sound was and realizing that the sound that I had been learning, the sound that I had been cultivating, the sound that made other people happy and made me happy, made me feel so good because I was, you know, kind of like calling on my ancestors whenever I sang that way. I realized that is not my only voice. I've got another voice. I've got an authentic sound. And what is that? Um, it took a lot of tinkering. It took a lot of being alone in my room for me to find what my sound is. And then I started working on this song and then I started working on an album. So like I got this song on my album called Cleveland. And it's like about how you go out of town with your significant other and it's real like a movie and y'all having a really good time. <laughs> and then you come back and it's whack. And you realize <laughs> that we were just so much better out of town, of course you were, because you were having a good time and you weren't home and you weren't like worried about all of those weird home things that you have to worry about, like bills and like your mom calling you or like being at work or like money. You got money to blow, you're out of town. You don't have anybody have to, have to see because you're out of town and like all of the all the perfect things about being with someone else out of town. So like, and I decided to play with all of the sounds that I love to play with, all of those Afrobeat sounds. So, ooh, 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 ooh. Okay, I'm gonna need your help. I'm gonna put this down. So, there's a clap, right? All right, come on. Well, hold up. You gotta stay in the pocket. Okay. Ooh. 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 This is it. This is it now. Baby, it's the last time. This is it. This is it now. Why you gotta yell? This is it. This is it now. Why you gotta scream? We were better in Cleveland, ooh, ooh. Okay. <laughs> so just finding what I, just, what I wanted to sound like and what I wanted to talk about and finding like that it doesn't take a lot of words to say the one thing that you really wanna say. Like, this is it now, why do you have to yell? This is it now, why do you have to scream? We were better in Cleveland. Woohoo, woohoo. Like it's just, it's just simple and you know exactly what I'm trying to say. And you can hear in how I'm saying it what, where the heartbreak is and where the disappointment is and where the hope is. Um, and I love all of those things about music. And as I continue to do more work, as I continue to, as I continue to love myself more, because I'm definitely someone with like low self-esteem and like not a lot of confidence, and I really only have, in my opinion, my music that like keeps me, keeps me lovely and keeps me motivated and keeps me remembering that I have so much to offer all the time. So the more I sing, the more I find myself and the more I find my community. 
and find my sound and found and find still what I want to be like still how I want to be in a room full of people and how when someone asks me well what do you want to sound like how easily that idea can change from wanting to be a bell to wanting to be like a shake array or wanting to be a blend of so many things but I feel like I'll always want to be a bell just because it rings and it's clear and it's true and it's honest. And the first, the first flick of a bell is always the best sound. Like after that, it's always, it helps you find where it is. But that first one tells you exactly where it is. Like whenever you hear a bell in any room, in a room as big as this, somebody could be hiding it and you hear it and you're like, it's over there. Always, and I always want to be that, and I always want to be that guiding light for my community, and I always want to be that guiding light for myself. Like, where's the last place that I rang and people heard me and loved me for, for that? Um, so yeah, thank you. <laughs>